Okay, hello and welcome to The Daily Space for June 13th, 2018. This is a special double episode that features not just The Daily Space, but Learning Space. As soon as I'm done going over the news, our special guest, Nancy Atkinson, will be with us. Hello, Nancy. Uh, She's currently waiting in the green room, and I'm going to do a very fast-paced roundup of the news and then get back to interviewing Nancy. Um, We have had a bit of technical difficulties today, namely I apparently clicked the start feed button and the feed didn't start. Uh, I am very sorry for that everyone and I appreciate you hanging out for this episode. Uh, So uh, to get started with today's news, I'm not going to start so much with today's top story as I am with today's most unexpected story. Coming to us from LIGO, those wonderful facilities that have been detecting gravitational waves, we have news that, well, the LIGO laboratories here in the United States are getting designated as historical sites for their Nobel winning uh, gravitational wave detection. Now, the thing that is so startling to me is these are still active facilities. They are still producing science. And I personally want to know is the National Park Service now going to help pay for the upkeep of these facilities and the science they are producing? Now, in addition to LIGO becoming a National Historic Site, we also have uh, information coming to us from a little bit further out. Looking out towards the Red Planet, we have an update on yesterday's story. As the dust storm continues to grow, we still have not heard back from the Little Opportunity Mars Exploration Rover. Opie is currently, well... He's not buried in dusk, he's hidden by dust. The dust that has been stirred up by high winds on the red planet is suspended in the atmosphere. And over the kilometers of altitude that this dust dust has gathered up in, well, the dust isn't going to bury the rover, it's not going to get it stuck. It is going to, however, block our ability to see the surface of the red planet and block little Opie's ability to see the sun and power its solar pan or and get power from its solar panels. Well, Mars Opportunity is struggling. NASA had plans already in place to take advantage of any dust storms that would occur and use those dust storms to generate new science. We currently have a fleet of craft at Mars. This includes not just Mars Opportunity, but also the nuclear powered Curiosity rover that is in no danger from this dust whatsoever. And orbiting the red planet, we have Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Mars Odyssey. At significantly lower altitudes, we also have the MAVEN mission, which at its lower altitudes is able to sample the Martian atmosphere. These missions are uh, gathering data that will hopefully help us be able to better predict how future dust storms on Mars will behave and thus give us better insights on how we can keep future spacecraft, rovers, and astronauts safe when future storms occur. Now, continuing to move outwards through our solar system, we have news coming to us from the Dawn mission as it orbits Ceres. This is actually an update on prior science. As we look at this asteroid with a variety of instruments on the uh, Dawn spacecraft, we are able to look and get hints of the composition of Ceres from how it's able to reflect light. Using this reflected light, scientists were able to say that there is a variety of organic materials on the surface of this asteroid. Now, by comparing how light, how sunlight is reflected off of Ceres, which coincidentally the sun just happens to shine for us, uh, we were able to say there are reflections that if they are similar to the reflections we see off of 
earth rocks that are rich in organic materials. Then the reflection spectrum that we see, well, six to 10 percent of that spectrum can be accounted for with organic molecules. Now, since these original results were announced, uh, scientists have had a further think about what's going on and have considered that perhaps instead of comparing the reflection, uh, reflect reflected light that we see at Ceres with reflected light off of Earth rocks, perhaps we should compare Ceres instead to meteorites that have hit the planet Earth space rocks that also happen to contain organic materials. By comparing these organic rich meteorites with the light that we see reflected off of Ceres, we actually are forced to change our estimates such that it now looks like if Ceres is closer in composition to these meteorites, that as much as 40 to 50 percent of the spectral signature that we see could be explained by organic materials. Now the new question is, is Ceres similar in composition to these meteorites that have been collected, or is it similar in composition to Earth and the organic rocks that we see on our planet, or perhaps is Ceres its own unique self and something entirely different? We won't know until someone goes out and starts picking up rocks. So here's a further argument to go back to Ceres, but next time to maybe do it with a rover. Uh, moving yet further out in our universe, we have uh, further details added to existing stories that we have coming to us about active galactic nuclei. These are galaxies that have black holes in their center that are surrounded by bright accretion disks driven by material working to spiral its way in towards those black holes. Now we've known for a long time that as you look at these active galactic nuclei, we see the amount of light coming from these objects changing over time, and we see the spectral signatures, which lines are bright, which are wide. We see all of these different factors changing over time. Now, uh, scientists who've been working to try and understand, understand what's going on, uh, working at the University of California, Santa Cruz, have added further details to the story, pointing out that these behaviors that we see can be completely understood through dust clouds inside uh, the openings of these active galactic nuclei that move around and block light sometimes, but not all the time, leading to these changing uh, appearances in the brightness of the light and the spectrum. Now, this is completely consistent with prior theories. It's always nice to see observations support ideas that were already in place. So here we are continuing to build the story, continuing to add details, um, and active galactic nuclei are just that one more bit understandable. Now, moving on to a story that uh, relates to science I had no idea was going on and results that I'm very glad to hear about, it turns out that there has been concern that dark matter might be responsible for a fifth force in our universe. In general, we're used to dealing with gravity, which is what causes things to fall here on our planet. We're used to dealing with the electromagnetic force, which is what holds us together and holds magnetic to our refrigerators, we're used to dealing with, well, we don't generally deal with it, but we're used to the benefits of the electro-strong and the electro-weak force, which hold together nuclei and also mediate things like beta decay, which is one form of radioactive decay. These four forces are generally used to, exp to explain everything we experience. And Luckily, it appears they are still the only four forces needed to explain what we observe in our universe. A team of scientists working at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy have been making highly detailed observations of how our own Earth and Moon are behaving over time. And they're looking to see if they can measure the effects of concentrations of dark matter uh, 
requiring an additional force to explain the observed motions we see. At this point, they've been able to say that everything that we observe with regards to the free fall of the moon around the Earth can be explained with gravity down to a factor of one in a hundred trillion. So while I didn't know this was experiment was going on, now that I know that this was a concern, I am very glad for these results. We still live in a universe where all we need is the four standard forces. Now, those are today's big stories coming to us from astronomy and space science. Uh, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions for the end of the show, because right now, I'd like to bring you today's special guest, Nancy Atkinson. Nancy, you are now on screen. Welcome to our show. Um, and <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. This is really a lot of fun. And thank you so much for your patience with my uh, initial technology failure. Um, nice to know I'm not the only one. <laughs> oh, no, no, we all have these days. Now, in prepping for this show, I realized you and I have been working together in one way or another since 2007, I think. I think so. Yeah, it's been an, it's been an amazing run and uh, a lot of fun for me. And I really have you to thank for so many opportunities of um, experiences that I've been able to do and meet people and go to certain events and all that stuff just just because of you. So thanks so much. Well, <laughs> that is not why you're here. Uh, but <laughs> thank you. Um, now, the reason I, I, I wanted to have you on is, first of all, you're doing amazing work with uh, the writing you're currently doing at Seeker, the work that you've been doing with Universe Today, the new book that you have out. And you have a story that is kind of the story that I think a lot of people wish could be their story, but lack the bravery to try and make happen. When, when I first met you, you were just starting to consider stopping being a librarian so so tell us what what was your we we all have gone through multiple careers you've gone through many many what were your first two career paths that you went down yeah it seems like my career has been a series of ironies or really really great uh coincidences that have happened so <laughs> So um, I think I've always been interested in space exploration, and I think that stems from when I was very young, the Apollo missions were going on. And mm -hmm. I, I don't remember a lot about them, but I just remember sitting on the floor with my sister kind of glued to the television set. You know, we were just watching all these broadcasts of the moon landing that I think just stuck with me for my entire life I you know it was just you know the excitement the drama and then the fact that we were exploring our solar system really resonated with me and um, I don't know if you had weekly readers in school Pamela. yes yeah okay yeah so whenever anything would come out in the weekly reader about space exploration I just remember being just enthralled by these images you know from the Viking landers or any of the of the missions going on. So um, I just always loved space exploration. And then add to that the fact that I grew up in a rural area. I grew up in North Dakota. And so I always had these beautiful night skies that I could go outside and look at. And I kind of took it for granted that I could see Aurora, you know, a, yeah. a lot during the, uh, during the winter times because of being so far north. Um, so uh, the, the stars have always been kind of part of my life. And, um, and those interests continued even in college, though I decided to study uh, literature and writing. Um, but after college, it seems like I always kind of gravitated towards the, the spacey side of life. I got involved with a, a local chapter of the National Space Society. Um, and then I got involved with an educational project um, that uh, was space related. And then later I was hired to work at a science museum and uh, but through that all, I always wanted to write, but I never had this kind of outlet or reason to write on a daily basis, which you know, everybody says, if you're going to be a writer, you have to write every day. Um, so um, but while I was working at the Science Museum of Minnesota, uh, that was like the coolest job ever. Uh, and and the irony comes in that um, 
when I was getting my English major, people would say, well, what are you going to do with your English major? And I said, well, I know I don't want to teach. Well, I ended up being a teacher at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And that was and through some very wonderful coincidences that I had the opportunity to uh, work there because they were looking for someone to head up a program, uh, a space program. They had access to a, a space shuttle. It was a one third inflatable space shuttle and they needed someone to design a program, uh, an educational program. And, and the space shuttle was big enough that it, there was no room to set it up at the Science Museum educational area. So I had to bring it to schools. And uh, I went out to schools for, a, for an entire week and worked with gifted and talented students. And uh, for two hours every day, we had what I called astronaut training. And uh, we did different kind of uh, hands-on experiments. And then Fridays, we would set up the space shuttle in the gym and the kids got to wear these Tyvek space suits and, and do all sorts of hands-on things. So that was a lot of fun. Could you and go during- inside? Yeah, yeah. So we could go inside and we set up experiments. You know, you had we had the the um, uh, space glove experiment where you put on like big thick gloves and you try to do things that astronauts have to do outside. Yeah, you know, wearing their big space gloves and um, some medical type experiments where kids listen to each other's heart heart rates and you know and uh, we did all sorts of. Um, other kinds of um, meteorite experiments, you know, just kind of really, really fun hands-on things. So um, one of the classes that I did was talking about the International Space Station, and I sent a sheet home with the kids for them of how they could see the space station pass over their house, you know, that that week. And so, and um, when we set up the space shuttle in the gyms on Fridays, so many times the parents would come in just to see this whole uh, fun uh, experiment that their kids got to do. And so many of them would come up to me and say, uh, this whole thing is really neat, but seeing the space station was just absolutely amazing. And I didn't even know we had a space station. And so that got me thinking of, uh, you know, how can I reach more people of, um, you know, telling everybody about the wonders of space exploration, all the cool things that are going on in space. So that's when I started to write and kind of at that same time was the internet was taking off and there was the opportunity to write. I did write a few articles for the local newspaper because there was an astronaut from Minnesota that went, uh, went to space and, um, uh, and then space.com had a very short lived program where they had people from uh, local areas uh, writing about things that were going on. Uh, in your own local area. So I, you know, that gave me the opportunity to, to actually be published because the, the one problem in, as being a writer is you can't get published until you've been published kind of problem. Right. So, um, so I, you know, with those few articles, I, uh, I had the chance to, to say that I was published. And then um, our family moved to Illinois and uh, there was no science museum there. We moved for my husband's job. And so that's when I started working at the library. And again, um, I worked with a great team of people there and they indulged me. And like for the summer reading programs, I got to do all these spacey things because that's what I love to do. And, uh, but then um, in 2004, um, I was looking at this space news site that I read a lot called Universe Today. <laughs> and uh, there was a little note on there from Fraser saying that he was looking for some writers, looking for some help. So I uh, sent him a, a note and, um, you know, sent him the articles that I had already had published online. And uh, I was hired. <laughs> so that's the, that's the, the long story of how I got to, uh, to start working with Fraser. And then because of working with Fraser. And uh, so I started in 2004 writing and just would write here and there whenever I had Mm -hmm. time. And then in 2007, Fraser said, do you think you could write more? And so uh, I kind of went half time and cut back at the library. And then in 2008, I went uh, full time. And uh, and then because of working with Fraser, I got hooked up with with working with you. And uh, And the International Year of Astronomy. Yes, that was a big thing that uh, you needed help with the with the uh, the podcast, the 365 yeah. Astronomy podcast. So that was uh, that was just uh, 
started everything and just took off from there. And so it takes a lot of guts to say, I am going to take this risk, jump from a completely stable job as a librarian. I mean, it's not completely sta stable. Small towns like to cut libraries. Yeah. Uh, but but it's still, there's a whole lot more security in, in being a librarian than in being a journalist. How did you convince yourself Yes, I can do this. And the reason I'm asking this is because I know that we have at least one librarian out in the chat right now who wishes that she was an astronomer and you're the next best thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it did take courage because even in 2004, uh, there's, you know, the, the, the chance that you could make money by writing articles and having them posted online just seemed kind of a remote possibility. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's changed a lot since since back then, but um, yeah, it it a little courage to to step back from the library job, which you got a regular paycheck, yeah. and um, and do that. But um, I loved working with Fraser. He was always he's always been so supportive and um, just uh, wonderful to work with. So I I didn't have any misgivings about about doing that. It was it was just kind of the wondering if I had the abilities to to write full time and, and to cover things on a daily basis. And uh, and that's been the really fun part is, you know, just being able to keep up with the daily space news and and share that with a wide audience. It's uh, it's been just so much fun. Now, uh, the part that you're leaving out is you were actually the editor, the senior editor of Universe Today for quite some time, and you were the one who was day to day making Universe Today what it is, was, while you were in that role. Um, now, you ended up writing a book that we're going to talk about more at the end of this episode. Uh, and this allowed you to go out and interview a ton of amazing humans. Between the things that you've gotten to do with Universe Today, talking to people for stories, and the people that you've talked to for your book, what are some of the things that you most look forward to? For instance, your grandkids being old enough that you can tell them the stories about this time I talked with. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of fun experiences. I, one of the most memorable experiences that I had was the first conference that I went to. It was a AAS conference that you had me go to, and it was in St. Louis. And so I stayed at your house and uh, also stay, also there was Phil Plate, and Fraser was supposed to be there, but it didn't work out for him to come. But then, then there was all these other that I had either written about or it, some interviewed some of them and it was you know I was kind of starstruck at that moment but so uh, that's always a very memorable one um yeah I you know and I had the chance to go down to Kennedy Space Center and I spent two months down there and watched launches and uh, interviewed people so it's I feel so fortunate that I've had the opportunity to interview so many amazing people you know astronauts and engineers and scientists and just to be able to sit across the table from them and pick their brains and and i think the funnest part though is when you are interviewing somebody face to face is you just get to see um the emotion on their faces yes. and um you know you can't they can't hide the the excitement that they feel in in making a scientific discovery or an engineer figuring out you know like how to fly the Dawn spacecraft on only two reaction wheels and, and that kind of thing. So um, that that is the funnest part is just the opportunity to talk to so many amazing people. And uh, and that's something I'll, I'll always cherish and uh, enjoy. And I think, you know, I could, uh, you know, go off into retirement land, but I think I'd, I'll always have a finger in uh, in writing about space news in at some in some level anyway and yeah you've you've kind of threatened to go at least partially retired on us more than once but you keep yes. coming back <laughs> i'm a bad penny 
So, so one of the most special things that I've gotten to experience periodically is seeing the absolute humanity in someone, seeing astronaut Don Pettit go up to National Geographic photographer Babak Tavarshi and be like, okay, so I was having these problems with my astrophotography while I was on the ISS. <laughs> and just having them talk just like two dorks with cameras. Have, yeah. have you had any of these, wow, these these heroes are absolute humans and I just want to barbecue with them kinds of experiences? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, at one of the, the space shuttle launches I was at, I, I ran into Chris Hadfield. You know, yeah. he just happened to be on hand for the launch. And it's like... As and, you do. Yeah. And <laughs> he, he saw me from across the room and waved and said, Nancy. And it was like, oh my gosh, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that happened to me with Bill Nye one time too. Where uh, oh, it was at a conference that we were at together, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, he just he saw me walking down the hallway, and he goes, Nancy, I need to talk to you, and <laughs> and uh, so yeah, that's uh, you know you don't expect when you're writing online and you're not really out there a lot. Um, you don't expect people to recognize you, but when when they do, it, it's uh, it's kind of fun. But yes, yeah, so that's that's something I'll uh, I'll probably be able to tell the grandkids. My my daughter in law is e extremely impressed that Bill Nye recognized me because she uh, she's just a huge Bill Nye fan. So. <laughs> Now, you've gotten to see a whole bunch of different launches uh, from down on the Cape. Uh, what What is that magic that comes? I, I've never heard of anyone who gets tired of watching rocket launches. Can, yeah. can you give us some insight on what it is about the launches that makes them so magical to get to experience? I think it's just uh, you know the sheer power of a of a rocket launch, and it's it's not something that you see every day, and or that anybody sees uh, on a regular basis. So I th I think the just the sheer power. Uh, I remember the the first space shuttle launch I went to. It was a night launch, and uh, so you, oh, wow. you see the the engines light, and uh, a little while later the sound com comes across the water. And um, I heard an astronaut describe it as the air just isn't big enough for the sound. Um, that's excellent. I, yeah, that's the best description I've yeah. ever heard of it. It's just, you just can't fathom. And I can only imagine what the Saturn V rocket sounded like because the space shuttle is just, was extremely loud. And, you know, my, my clothes were fluttering, not from wind, but from the sound waves. And that's, you know, that's just incredible. So all those experiences um, you know, lumped together in, in seeing a rocket launch, feeling a rocket launch. And, and then you have the chance normally, uh, you know, like for the space shuttle launches, we had the chance to interview the astronauts ahead of time. So you kind of get to know them and their personalities. And, you know, you know that they're on this bomb that's going up into space and uh, feeling happy for them and nervous and uh, excited all at the same time. So it's, um, yeah, I, I I would love to, uh, uh, you know, I have this vision of uh, retiring to Florida and just going to see rocket launches whenever I can. But uh, as, for now, I'm up, I'm up in the, I'm back in Minnesota and uh, living here and, and loving it. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a pipe dream, I guess. <laughs> I, we're all allowed to have whatever dreams we feel like. And I think that is a awesome dream to have. <laughs> now, <laughs> You've gotten to see a variety of launches. You got involved in writing a lot of stories. And part of being a journalist is showing up for the press conferences and being there next to the guy from the New York Times asking the questions. What was it like for you emotionally the first time you were in one of these big press conferences, having come from working in a museum, working in a library, to now being shoulder to shoulder with people who might be trying to get Pulitzer, Pulitzers and asking your own knowledgeable questions? Yeah, I think my heart was beating so hard and so fast that <laughs> I don't, I'm, 
surprised I was able to get the words out of my throat. But uh, yeah, it's it's nerve wracking at first, and then um, but then you you do it a few times, and you realize that you uh, end up having questions that nobody else thought of, yes. or um, you know, or you you see a, an aspect of it that that nobody else really um, you know considered before. So that gives you some confidence when when that happens, and um, and you know, now I've been around long enough that it's like, it's not a big deal to call into a NASA press conference and ask a question and, um, you know, it, but but still it's fun. I, I don't say that it's, uh, that I take it for granted because it's, um, it, it's a, I think it's a, I have the coolest job in the world and, uh, <laughs> and that I have the, uh, you know, it's, it's also, uh, you know, working online and, I'm kind of in the freelance side right yeah. now because I'm not a senior editor at university anymore. I'm just considered a contributing editor. And um, so uh, that if anybody is looking for a kind of a flexible job, uh, that's uh, that's one of the side benefits of being a freelancer is that you've got um, the ability to kind of set your own schedule. And um, even though launches occur at any time of the day or night um, <laughs> or or, uh, or other events, you know, like the, uh, well, you know, when I remember when Curiosity landed, that was late at night, and uh, you know, so you're you're sometimes you're doing odd hours and and strange places and all that, but uh, still, it's it's a great job. Now I I've brought up the Universe Today website, and I'm just trying to get it to fit better, and it's being obstinate and refusing to. So. One of one of my favorite things that you did on Universe Today was your Where in the Universe series. Do, do you remember that one? And was that originally your idea? You know, I don't I don't remember. Um, you know, Fraser has just he's just he has, he comes up with all these great ideas. I, I I'll I'll probably have to uh, give it to Fraser. But yeah, uh, he he's. Um, He's just got an intuitive mind for figuring out what what really interests people and uh, um, you know creative ways to do things. I mean his um, his uh, video series that he's yeah. been doing for years now is just wonderful, and he's developed such a. Uh, I never thought of him when I first met met him as a, a funny guy, but he really has a great sense of humor. And he's <laughs> developed it over the years. It's I have to say, as someone who works side by side with him, he has gone from being someone who's amazing behind a mic to also being someone who's amazing on stage. And it was a journey, and he has made amazing accomplishments. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, yeah. I'm I'm amazed when I see him. Um, uh, live in live events or you know just on camera or anything he's just got uh, a great ease and, and great uh, conversational style um, and it's uh, yeah it's it's fun to watch him and uh, fun to see you two together you guys are, are great together <laughs> thank you so much um so so going back to you uh you are now working uh part-time freelance just about everywhere, but one of my favorite places to find you is over on Seeker, where you have a whole variety of stories, uh, I'm scanning through these now, um, that pop up in the popular media. Um, what's it like to now have your articles appear side by side with all things mainstream? Yeah, uh, it's uh, writing for Seeker has been a unique opportunity uh, that came from uh, the the editors there kind of uh, um, uh, found out about me from my book, I guess, yeah. and so uh, it's a direct kind of a direct result of writing the book, and uh, the things that they like me to write about are are longer articles that delve into kind of the the news that you see coming out of the journals like Science and Nature. And um, so I, you know, have the opportunity to write about the kind of the big news that's being released, uh, uh, the biggest news of the week in, in space exploration, at, or mostly in astronomy and uh, uh, some of the some of the missions too. So, yeah, it's fun. It's it's a different. Um, it's you know longer, longer articles and 
uh, more writing, more interviewing. Um, you know, sometimes the great thing about writing for Universe Today is is sometimes you would write longer articles mm -hmm. and and do lots of interviews, but other times you can just post a, a video that somebody, yeah. you know, like a night sky video, and just say, "Wow, look at this!" You know, and that's amazing. So uh, it's 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 the great combination of being a blog and a news site. So um, yeah, Universe Today is 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 great. Now, one of the big differences going from Universe Today to Seeker is you went from a website that pretty much only other space and astronomy lovers are going to land on to being on a site that draws people from all different walks of life. Have you found that this changes the kind of emails you get and how frequently your family's like, whoa, I just found you on the internet? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's funny that um, I was just going through my inbox and it's like, where did all these emails come from? Because yeah, you get, you end up getting contacted by a lot of different um, PR firms or universities or that kind of thing. And it's, uh, it's kind of multiplied over the years of the people who try to contact you or, um, you know, to get information about or to get you to write an article about the, their latest press release or a, a new book coming out. So, um, yeah, I definitely could write a lot more than what I do because there's just uh, so much to write about. And, you know, I, I always say when people find out that I'm a, a science journalist and they'll, they'll and sp they're writing about space exploration and, you know, especially like after the space shuttle program ended and they said, oh, what, are, what do you write about? And it was like, I cannot keep up with all of the news coming out. You know, not only yeah. is there the International Space Station as the, for the human side, but there's just so much going on with uh, all of the different planetary missions and Hubble and and uh, and then all of the research that's being done by the um, ground-based telescopes and and other things, you know, LIGO and all those things. So it's uh, there's no shortage of things to write about. Now, in in terms of no shortage of things to write about, now is the time to bring up your book. This is incredible stories from space. Space. <laughs> There's something about the title that just like I you have to say from space, <laughs> um, and and you managed to squeak in the breaking news of New Horizons at the very last moment as this book was getting ready to go to press. Uh, yeah. So I I have to admit this book is one that you sent me. Uh, a, pr a promotion copy of and then I also got a copy for Christmas because people love this book so much um, <laughs> how how did you get the idea for the book and and what was it like sitting down and and being the person yes I am now a book author I am doing a book <laughs> well um, I probably have the easiest um, book uh, oppor easiest opportunity to write a book ever because the publishing company contacted me. Um, uh, obviously, or I had heard that the publisher is a, he reads Universe Today all the time. And uh, he had the idea for a book about kind of just NASA's robotic missions, the current missions going on. And uh, he wondered if I'd be interested in writing it. Well, that's, well, that's definitely not a call you get very often in your life to, no. you know, and really writing a book was not on my radar at that time. That was kind of when I told Fraser I was going to cut back a little bit. <laughs> and then this guy approaches me about writing a book. So that that was kind of weird timing. But um, I guess it, it ended up working out okay. And uh, yeah, um, it was, and they kind of like, um, they didn't really have uh, a format or a, um, uh, an idea of what how the book should be laid out. And they kind of left it up to me. So I was kind of like, oh, uh, wow. you know, whatever I wanted to do. And so I said, well, I know I have to interview people. So yeah. uh, I lined up trips out to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and just had three days of solid back-to-back -back interviews. And and I have to give JPL so much thanks to the, the media department there. So like I, uh, I called him up and said, um, I'm writing a book about the planetary missions and I'd like to talk to the, you know, a scientist and an engineer from each of these 
missions and uh, they set up this series of interviews and hauled me around on, on a golf cart from place to place and on the JPL campus and that was great. And then I went to um, uh, out to Baltimore area and went to Goddard Space Flight Center and talked to people about the um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope out there. And I also got to the went to the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. That was a trip. I mean, that's this. The I mean, the history is just oozing out of the walls there. It's just such an amazing place. And then I got to go to um, uh, New Horizons uh, Control Center at um, uh, APL. APL. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that was a lot of fun. I got to sit uh, sit in that control room. So this was just a couple of months after the flyby had happened, the Pluto flyby. And I got to sit in the control room where we had seen all that action taking place the day of the flyby. And it was just me and Alice Bowman sitting in the room all by ourselves <laughs> instead of this jam-packed control room yeah. that I remember seeing that day. So that was that was so much fun to 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 talk with her and uh, and her and uh, Hal Weaver and yes. then of course I interviewed Alan Stern as well. Uh, I, I start the book off with how I interviewed Alan Stern, which is how I normally interview Alan Stern is that he's driving from one meeting to another and I catch him, you know, in his car and it's hard to hear and, <laughs> and I, you know, and he's, he's, uh, you know, getting out of his car and, you know, opening up briefcases and still just talking wonderfully the whole way through. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of fun, but yeah, it's, uh, it was so much fun to uh, talk about all of these missions. Um, you know, like the Juno mission was coming up and I kind of had to write it as though Juno actually had made it successfully into orbit around Jupiter, which it that did. That was hopeful. Yeah, that was very hopeful. <laughs> and, um, you know, because there's, you know, it's, it's not, it's so different from writing online is, you know, you can, writing online, you can go in and make updates or corrections, that kind of thing. But, you know, once you publish a book, there it is. And, you know, w whether there's a mistake in there or uh, something that changes the mission, you know, like the uh, changes in, um, you know, Cassini mission was getting ready to end. And uh, that I kind of had to preview of what what the end was going to be like. And it pretty much happened how uh, how the people kind of explained of, of yeah. what was going to happen. So, yeah, it was... Uh, it's you're you're in this weird time lag of when you're writing a book is that you have to kind of write about how things are going to be in the future, um, especially when you're writing about current missions. You know, there's so many discoveries that take place, um, you know, that that change the course of the mission or, you know, something yeah. on the spacecraft breaks like on the Dawn mission. So um, it was uh, it was, uh, you know, I talked to 37 NASA scientists and engineers for the book, and it was uh, it was great fun. And I hope that um, I, I was able to convey the you know everyone that I talked to just had such passion and dedication yeah. and and just excitement for their mission and for space exploration in general. And uh, Mark Raymond for the Dawn mission was especially memorable. He, he brought me to tears in his office. He was talking about the wonders of space exploration and all, you know, all of humanity is, is doing this as part of their mission. And it was just like, you know, I was teary eyed in his office, but uh, what, a, what a great experience and a great memory that I'll always have. That that is truly truly awesome. Now we're running out of time, uh, in part because I screwed up. So thank you for your patience, audience. I will stick around and answer questions, potentially via chat. I do have another meeting I'm supposed to be going to, but before we, I already see people popping in. Um, so one quick question as we round up, Nancy. Um, can okay they're popping back out uh can you uh tell us since this was a behind the scenes story what is the most behind the scenes unexpected story that is the reason people should buy your book oh the the story of the that iconic mission of or iconic picture of pluto of the you know the heart the yeah. whole planet that came out the morning of the flyby 
the story behind uh, how they almost did not get that picture is is really uh, interesting and it's and it's it's funny too. I mean, it's um, a combination of people being sleep deprived because they were you know feverishly working on this mission and um, you know the the spacecraft had they had lost contact with the spacecraft like about ten days prior to the yeah. flyby and so they were working to reestablish contact and to upload the the Man. instructions for the flyby and yeah so they there was a lot of sleepy people <laughs> during that flyby so okay so folks if you want to read the details of that story uh, you're gonna have to go buy the book so available on Amazon in paperback and ebook it is incredible stories from space I'm putting the link into the chat now, uh, I do unfortunately have another meeting that is about to take over this Zoom line, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm going to hang out in chat, answer as many questions as I can. I invite Nancy to hang out in the chat, Nancy over here, to hang sure. out in the chat as well. Um, this has been a fabulous interview. And again, thank you so much for your patience with my technique technological screw up at the beginning. Um, and I look forward to seeing all the new ways you find not to retire in the coming decades. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Pamela. This has been great. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for the subscription, Bill Nash. Um, so this has been the Daily Space and Learning Space. We are part of CosmoQuest and you are invited to come on over to CosmoQuest.org and help us explore this universe we all share. We currently have a data call for both Mars and Mercury so if you can take a moment to map out one of these M worlds it would be greatly appreciated. CosmoQuest is a multiple, multiple institution collaboration led by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Uh, our next show is going to be tomorrow's Daily Space, coming to you at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. London. If you like what you see, please give us a follow. Thank you for the bits, Keeper of Maps. Um, please give us a follow. And if you want to sustain our efforts, please consider a subscription. And every bit, including every weird bit, I'm looking at you, Gordon, with very graceful but grateful but confused eyes. Um, every bit helps. Uh, so stay tuned. We're going to be here every day. Well, not every day, but most days working to put science in your heads. Uh, tomorrow, following the Daily Space, starting about 1230, we're going to have Dr. Matt Richardson teaching Astro 101 to our own Big J, who you may have seen in today's chat. Uh, Matt Richardson comes to us from the Planetary Science Institute. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And remember to look up. Bye-bye. <laughs>